when we want to build a new research organization, we have to ask ourselves the question, what, what, what makes up a good research environment? What makes up a good research organization? And uh, this is not a question that we've been asking for, as the first people. There are actually a lot of people that have been asking these questions before, and some of them are even in the room with us today, about um, what have been in history, research organizations have been very productive, research environments that have been extremely productive, and what were the key hallmarks that made them effective? And um, these are just some snippets. So this is a slide actually from the last one in the Commons uh, conference, a slide from Juan, then uh, Ben Reinhardt has been talking about private ARPAs. Um, this is a book I can very much recommend by Michael Nielsen, and then um, Adam Marblestone and uh, Sam Rodriguez's work on uh, focused research organizations. And when I think about what all of these works have in common, there are three elements that, for me at least, keep recurring, which is um, scientists have access to tools. They need to be able to basically test the, the boundaries of theory and, and tinker there and, and bump things against each other at, at the sort of cutting edge of technology. Then they need to be able to form dynamic teams, teams that ha consist of scientists from different disciplines, maybe even not only scientists, but also practitioners that have very valuable micro-expertise. Um, and then they need to be able to have some unconditional funding to get started, and then ideally a smooth distribution of uh, funding access as, the pro as these projects mature. And I think one understudied example of uh, where there was a productive research environment where the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory courses after World War II. So Cold Spring Harbor is actually not that far from here. It's like a 50 minute, 50 minute commuter rail uh, train ride from New York. Um, and after World War II, you had uh, chemists, uh, biologists, and also physicists come together at Cold Spring Harbor and study the interaction between bacteria and phages. And that was at a time where the structure of DNA was uh, not yet discovered or just about to be discovered. Um, and by coming together only over a summer, with a diverse group of teams that had very specific uh, micro expertise. So, for example, Max Delbruck was a trained nuclear physicist, didn't know a lot about phages and bacteria, but had a very quantitative way of looking at the world. Um, these groups of scientists were able to ask some really interesting questions, had the lab, you can see that in the background, to start some very easy first experiments, and then um, would go back to their research institutes, some of them in the Europe, some of them in the States, and were able to write the grants that they needed in order to actually do the meaningful work um, that then later to a lot of, led to a lot of breakthroughs. So wrapping it up, I think what scientists need to be in an effective research environment, they need access to scientific infrastructure to allow for this targeted tinkering, this access to like, a new method that allows you to discover something about the world in a new way. They need to be able to form dynamic teams that might also just be very project focused. So for example, at DARPA, um, teams don't come together because there is a, a professor that has tenure and that's their lab. They come together because there are a particular project that needs to be solved or needs to be addressed. Um, and then they need to be able to raise funding to develop initial infrastructure and then also accelerate the inv inventions uh, basically with what um, Ben Reinhardt calls a smooth project size distribution. So you need to have, uh, you need to be able to grow a, a project in terms of the funding that it receives from it is just an idea to this is a research project to this is already outside of the scope of a normal funding organization but maybe still not um, interesting enough for a venture capitalist towards this is a, this is a serious technology company. So then the next question is, if we, if we feel like we have answered some of these questions, what makes up an interesting and productive research environment, uh, why do we want to do this online? And, and this is a bit of a personal story. So this is a graph that shows the movement patterns of inventors. And on the y-axis, you can see uh, the net migration patterns where if the bar is below the zero line, that means this country is, is uh, sort of churning inventors. The inventors leave this country. An inventor is a person in this study that has published a patent. And then on the x-axis, you have different countries. And I was born on the left-hand side of this graph and then grew up on the right-hand side and then moved back to the left-hand side, got back to the right-hand side, and today I'm back on the left-hand side. And at some point, you start to ask yourself, well, how many times do I need to move between these two different places? And isn't there a lot of talent, a, a lot of potential inventors that actually do not have access to the means of invention and cannot be inventors because for them, it's so far out of reach. The next laboratory is so far out of reach. The access to like dynamic teams is so far out of reach. The access to funding is so far out of reach. Um, and with LabDAO, we want to build a home for inventors online so that 
the location where you are becomes less important uh, with, with regards to your ability to, to actually innovate. Which leads us actually to this overall goal that we have in the decentralized science movement, the idea that within DSI, we give everybody the opportunity to raise funds irrespective of where they're located and irrespective of whether it's a basic science funding project or it, it has more of an entrepreneurial nature. We want to give everybody the ability to access laboratory services, to run experiments, no matter where they're based. And we want to also build the infrastructure um, for scientists to share the data that they've collected in ways that reward both the inventor for the invention that they've made, but also maintains the accessibility for the commons. And when we look at the DSI stack today, and I tend to think about decentralized science or science in general as this three-step process where we have funding agencies, we have execution agencies, places where actually the science gets, gets done, and then you have distribution mechanisms. Over the last couple of months, really, we have seen an explosion in projects where you can see, for example, Science Fund, Gitcoin, VitaDAO as agencies that can help you raise capital for a scientific idea that you have. And then you have a lot of different projects um, that are targeting the distribution of scientific insight, Research Hub, Atoms, DSI Labs, uh, Molecule on the more translational side, and Op side for scientific data. And what's really, I think, missing in the middle is a place where teams of scientists and tools of scientists interact where the funding has been collected and now you want to build your lab, you, you want to build your web lab and you want to have access to particular services that, um, to generate new data and then you can distribute that new insight that you've gathered. And that's something that we're really passionate about at LabDAO. So the way that we want to provide that insight is by basically uh, building two to three products that are focused on the team side and the tool side and then an initial funding spark that I won't focus on too much today. So how do we bring tools into an online room? How do we bring something like a cell culture bench into an online chat room? That's a really, not, not, that's a really important question when we think about decentralized science. And uh, the, the answer that we have at LabDAO is that we create a marketplace protocol where laboratories that are either for-profit or non-profit can share their services um, and, and offer their services in a very structured format. And then we have team formation processes that we're currently bundling under the idea of, of lab teams uh, where we lead these, uh, give, them, give these scientists a room to come together um, and also become discoverable by people that have micro expertise. So let's talk about the lab exchange first. The lab exchange is a DAO government peer-to-peer -peer exchange for data generating laboratory services. So for example, if I have uh, a small molecule that I've designed computationally, the next question really after going through all the in silico tools that are at my disposal within this group of scientists that I have found uh, within LabDAO is to then actually synthesize the small molecule and see what other properties and test the binding behavior to a particular target if I'm interested in that. And for that, I need to have laboratories that actually offer the service of synthesizing a small molecule and testing its behavior um, and, and they need, to be, they need to be available on some kind of exchange. So right now, the way that this exchange exists as a protocol um, is, is in a very early stage, and the way that you interact with it, the client, is also very much focused on the first user group, which are computational biologists that use the client to run in silico discovery processes and then go through the very first steps of taking something that is only, a, for example, a structural formula or a sequence of amino acids into the physical space, into protein space or small molecule space. So the way that you currently interact with the exchange is through a client that is still pre-release. Um, and there are some like, key functions that you can see here. Uh, so there are basically two topics right now. You can list all the available apps, so for example, the hello world example for, for the lab exchange is a reverse complement function. You give a DNA sequence in, you get a DNA sequence out. Uh, but obviously also more complex stuff where someone else, on the, uh, there could be a laboratory on the other end on the exchange that, for example, folds, protein com folds proteins computationally. And then uh, what's important for us is that the data that scientists generate is also shared and at least visible to everybody. Um, so it's d deeply integrated with uh, IPFS and Estuary in this case, where from your command line you can upload a research file uh, via Estuary and expose it to, I via IP uh, to IPFS. And then basically you reference that when you submit a request to the exchange. So how do you ensure quality in, ex in an exchange where people trade laboratory services? 
there are really three mechanisms that we can make use of. The first one is if you have a client, so the scientist, uh, that's requesting a laboratory service from a provider, say a laboratory, the, the flow of capital from the, the scientist to the laboratory is not direct, but the, the funds are held in escrow, and there's an arbitration service that if the scientist is not happy with the result, with the quality in which the laboratory services was um, completed, can basically appeal for an arbitration. And the second mechanism is the staking and slashing. So the lab DAO plans to have a governance token lab that will be used by community members to basically collateralize the transactions that are taking place. So for example, if there's a transaction that's worth $10,000, such as synthesizing a protein, I expect the lab that's doing to work to put something at stake that's proportional to the value of the transaction. So if the lab is not doing the work in, in, in good faith, then it, the ownership of the lab, the membership of the lab within the DAO can be revoked. And then as a third billing block, um, not everybody can directly tr list on the exchange. We're working through ways in which the, the DAO itself can onboard laboratories on the exchange in something that's akin to a token curated registry to ensure quality standards and also just overall compliance with regulators. So when I open a request on the lab exchange, the, the way I do this is um, I, I open, I change the state of the smart contract and I basically provide some billing blocks that will later go into something that is called the lab NFT. Where the metadata is relatively simple, I say I want to, for example, here, generate a reverse complement. And this is a standardized request where the whole DAO is maintaining a repository of different laboratory services that are offered. And I say, OK, this is the user. That's my wallet. There are some parameters. and In this case, there are not a lot of parameters. And this is my input file, which is the FASTA file. And then this is posted, and once the laboratory claims that transaction and says, I'm, I'm on it, and does the job, um, it adds three additional data fields, takes that metadata, mints it into an NFT, and sends it to my wallet, where the three additional fields are the identity of the provider, um, any type of execution environmental information. So was this done, for example, if it was a computational job, in what computational environment was it done? And then the output itself, which in this case would be a FASTA file, so just a genetic sequencing file. Yeah. And our hope is that through this open source community, we cannot only maintain the, the development of new tools, but we can also drive the standard emergence of standardizations around laboratory services overall. So because otherwise the re conflict resolution cost between scientists is going to be so high. So the hope is that over time, scientists will converge on certain standards for how laboratory services are done such that we eventually end up in a state where something that is one-off, one where we have a one-to-one -one relationship, eventually there's liquidity around a certain laboratory services and you have many-to-many -many relationships. And eventually, actually all the past transactions can be queried as if they were a knowledge graph, which they are, uh, and you can develop more co complex multi-step transactions where you actually plan complete experimental uh, projects and can find someone to run them for you. So this is how we plan to provide basically physical laboratory services to online research communities. And then on the second side, it's not only the tools that matter, it's also the teams that matter that actually use them. So we need to build tools that en enable teams to come together online and form these dynamic teams. So the question is how can we facilitate dynamic team formation? And what I think is really important is that, w that we have subgroups with subject matter stewards where there is, some, uh, there is a scientist that had an idea for an initial project that is leading, leading a group. We need to have a forum for conversations where scientists uh, can meet and that guide expert attention. And then we need tools in which even an, an outsider that might just be browsing through the community sees something that's interesting and can contribute their micro expertise. And there's, a, for, for everybody that wants to think a bit more about how do we design communities such that expertise is, is concentrated in the most effective way and, and we have tools for collective intelligence. Um, Michael Nielsen has one chapter where he compares um, Kasparov versus the world versus, and Karpov versus the world. Both of them were chess games. And in both cases, the chess master was playing against an online community 
uh, but the tools that these online communities were using to make decisions around the chess moves are very different. And, and in both cases, the chess masters won, but in one case, it was way closer than anybody had expected, and it was because the way that the mechanism was designed uh, had subgroups, subject matter stewards, and ways for discovery of micro expertise. Another question that we have to ask is how do we actually get scientists to contribute to a DAO? This is still something that's very out there. If you're an academic scientist, you probably haven't heard a lot about what the type of work is that we're doing. So we invest a lot of time in building onboarding flows that explain all of decentralized science and take you through like a step-by-step -step process and onboard you into the community. And then something that we want is that LabDAO is a DAO of laboratories where each lab starts out as a community of people that focus on a particular problem, focus on a particular project idea, or develop a, or maintain, and maintain a particular open source repository, but then over time develop their own culture, start annotating and t keeping track of their contributions among each other. And this is just a screenshot for one of our coordinate graphs, which is a peer-to-peer -peer system in which we track contributions within our, our labs. And then eventually even spin out as an independent sub-DAO, where this could really be the, the point where, for example, future folks research organizations meet, or future biotech companies meet, and, and then eventually branch off and um, focus on themselves and the project that they want to develop. So how do I think we can further develop the DSI stack? I think on the funding side, I would like everybody to just explore new experiments in which we can fund science. I think reputation systems might be really interesting, but also dangerous, um, so that we don't repeat mistakes uh, that we have with the current ecosystem, where reputation is extremely important and the funding is very centralized. And then on the execution side, I think we need to just onboard more laboratory capacity, and that's something that I'm really excited about. And then on the distribution side, I think it would be very interesting if we not only think about the sharing of final research products, such as a publication or an IP NFT, but also think about how do you share hypotheses. So for example, an entry in a knowledge graph that, starts with a, that ends with a question mark, that is a shelling point for scientists to come together and share their opinions. Um, and, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, look forward to the conversations afterwards. Thank you.